Well, <laughs> we're going to go ahead and get started. We know that a lot of people are still stuck in traffic and will be trickling in throughout the night. Uh, my name is Sharice Hines. I am the president of the American Constitution Society for Law and Policy. And we are thrilled to have you guys here tonight, as well as our speakers who are just an all-star bunch up here. Um, I wanted to take a moment and introduce our moderator, uh, Professor John Pagan. Um, he is a professor of law at, uh, here at the University of Richmond. He was additionally the dean of the law school for a period of time and served on the Arkansas legislature. And he uh, specifically teaches classes in election law. So Professor Pagan, would you like to take it? Thanks very much. Uh, good evening and welcome. Uh, I want to commend the organizers for putting together uh, an exciting program on issues of critical importance as we prepare for the upcoming Virginia general election and next year's presidential and congressional races. Uh, as was mentioned, I teach election law, so this is a good opportunity for me to put in a commercial uh, for the law students who would like to take it. Uh, I'm a legal historian by trade, so I don't often get to talk about current events. But we'll have this uh, course next fall during the presidential election, and I hope it'll be uh, a lot of fun. In the past, I've opened it to undergraduates as well. Uh, so uh, please come and join me. Uh, I also, in a previous life, was a politician. Uh, I uh, served in the Arkansas Senate when Bill Clinton was governor of Arkansas and uh, was in local government before that. I ran uh, five races during that part of my life, and so I had to... Uh, an up close and personal experience with these election laws that are going to be discussed by the panel tonight. Uh, that's one reason that I find the subject so fascinating. We're fortunate to have a distinguished panel of experts with us. I'll introduce all of them and then call on each speaker individually to offer prepared remarks followed by responses from the other panelists. Our first speaker will be Kent Willis. Executive Director of the American Civil Liberties Union of Virginia, a nonpartisan organization that promotes and protects civil rights and civil liberties through public education, litigation, and lobbying. Now, although he looks a lot younger than I am, Mr. Willis and I actually uh, were students together at the College of William and Mary. And since those long, -a -day, uh, long ago days, he's had a distinguished career as an environmental activist an advocate for disabled persons and equal housing opportunities, and as a defender of the Constitution. Under his leadership, the ACLU has been deeply involved in election issues in Virginia, promoting voter education and the use of fair and open practices during redistricting. Our second speaker, they changed the uh, order up on me a little bit, so the gentleman who's uh, second from the end, uh, Jerry Hebert, the Executive Director and Director of Litigation at the Campaign Legal Center in Washington, D.C., an organization that represents the public interest in the enforcement of campaign and media law. At the Justice Department, Mr. Hebert headed the voting section of the Civil Rights Division, serving as the lead attorney in over 100 voting rights and redistricting lawsuits. He also spent many years in private practice, and has taught courses at Georgetown University Law Center on voting rights, election law, and campaign finance regulation. He's been an outspoken critic of 501c4 groups, which are tax-exempt entities that are, in theory, established for the purpose of promoting social welfare and thus do not have to disclose their donors. But in practice, they are becoming major political players. And last month, the New York Times quoted Mr. Hebert as saying, the abuses of the tax code by these shadow campaign organizations has mushroomed since the last election cycle with both Democrats and Republicans now in on the act and not even bothering to maintain a facade that they have any real purpose other than to elect members of their respective parties. And I hope you'll say more about this interesting issue during today's program. And our third speaker will be Delegate Jennifer McClellan, seated in the middle. I'm especially pleased to welcome her back to her alma mater because she represents my neighborhood, the FAN, in the Virginia House of Delegates, and she's done a terrific job. After graduating from UR in 1994, Delegate McClellan earned her law degree at the University of Virginia. 
She's Assistant General Counsel Mid-Atlantic South for Verizon Communications, focusing on state regulatory matters. She's immediate past president of the Virginia State Bar Young Lawyers Conference, and she serves on numerous boards of community organizations. She was elected to the House of Delegates in 2005 and sits on the House Commerce and Labor, Courts of Justice, and Education Committees. She's a member of the Virginia Legislative Black Caucus and vice chair of the House Democratic Caucus. She's been a leader on issues related to poverty reduction, domestic violence prevention, and career and technical education. Our fourth speaker, uh, will be, who's seated at the far end, will be John Harden Young, one of the nation's leading electoral recount and dispute resolution lawyers. He practices with Sandler, Reef, Young, and Lamb in Washington and has held numerous major government appointments, including general counsel to the Office of Administration, Executive Office of the President. He's a graduate of the University of Virginia Law School and is an adjunct professor at William & Mary, where he teaches courses on comparative election law, election dispute resolution, redistricting, and public participation in the electoral process. Our fifth speaker will be Donald Palmer, who's the second to my right, uh, who currently serves as secretary of the Virginia Board of Elections, a post to which he was appointed by Governor Bob McDonald. He's the chief elections official of the Commonwealth of Virginia and the head of the state agency charged with implementation and uniformity of the state election laws. Before coming to Virginia, Mr. Palmer served as director of elections for the state of Florida, where he improved processes of registration verification and implemented changes to align Florida with the federal Military and Overseas Voter Empowerment Act. Earlier in his career, he served as a trial attorney with the Department of Justice Civil Rights Division and Voting Section, where he enforced the federal voting laws and provided guidance to states on compliance with the Voting Rights Act, the Help America Vote Act, and the National Voter Registration Act. And I appreciate all five of our speakers being with us today. Uh, and I'll now uh, turn the program over to Mr. Willis. Good evening. Can you hear me? Good. Um, I'm going to talk probably uh, sort of kick things off with a, a broad sense about access to the polls. I mean, we are a democracy, uh, and in this democracy, voting is a right, uh, and voting ought to be easy. The problem right now, and there's a movement in this country to make voting more difficult than it already is, um, in a country where voting is not that easy. Um, what I thought I would do is talk about two sort of myths uh, related to, to voting that have steered us in very unreasonable ways uh, as we look at who gets to vote uh, and how they get to vote and how easy it is to get to vote. Uh, the first one I can't help talking about, even though it's practically unique to Virginia, at least in the form that it is, and this is the issue of felon disenfranchisement. Um, as you may know, Virginia uh, probably has the worst in the nation felon disenfranchisement law. Only Virginia and Kentucky are the only two states in the entire nation that permanently disenfranchise anyone who's committed a felony. You lose your vote, uh, your right to vote for life if you've committed uh, a felony. The only way you can get it back is if the governor uh, gives you something akin to a pardon based on an individual application. Um, this law, uh, everyone reacts to it very emotionally. They say, well, I mean, these are people who've committed felonies. They shouldn't be able to vote. Um, I mean, there's everything wrong with that that you can imagine. First of all, the origins of, the, uh, origins of this law are Jim Crow. This was a law created in Virginia, or sort of picked up and reinitiated in Virginia, along with uh, poll taxes and literacy tests. Uh, and in Virginia, also unelected school boards all of which were intended to suppress African-American vote uh, during the Jim Crow uh, period. Um, it still has that taint to it, um, but unfortunately there doesn't seem to be a good legal angle to challenge this. This is something that we have to do in the state legislature. Um, by the way, in, if you're in Maine or um, Vermont and you commit a felony, you, can, you never lose your right to vote. You can continue to vote from jail. 
the vast majority of uh, states in this country, once you finish serving out your sentence, you are given your vote, your right to vote back. In Virginia, you are not, and in Kentucky, you are not. Um, that leaves 300,000 Virginians unable to vote at this time due to felon disenfranchisement. Um, Governor Warner, Governor Kane, and now Governor McDonnell have streamlined the process for restoring the right to vote, but what they're talking about doing is during their entire terms enabling another five or 6,000 people to vote. This is a drop in the bucket, the 300,000 people who can't vote. Uh, and by the way, um, Studies show that uh, if you're given your right to vote after you've committed a felony and you've come out of uh, prison, if you've served time, uh, you're less likely to commit another crime if you're registered to vote. So there are actually compelling reasons to give people the right to vote uh, once they come out of uh, jail or prison. The truth is we should never take the right away. You should be able to vote uh, regardless, uh, but it doesn't happen that way. In Virginia, the Senate uh, will often pass a bill. This, this is part of the Virginia Constitution. It's a complicated process. takes at least two years uh, to amend the Constitution. The Senate typically passes a bill uh, changing this law, bringing Virginia in line with almost every other state in the nation, uh, but we can't get it through the House. So if there's something you feel like lobbying on, uh, a right that's, um, that's extremely important, uh, that's racially tainted, uh, you should help Virginia get rid of this shameful disenfranchisement law. The other issue is voter fraud. Um, there's probably no greater myth in this country than the notion of voter fraud, uh, but it's what motivates a lot of the laws we're seeing right now that are intended to make it harder to vote. The idea that individuals impersonate another person, that is vote twice, it almost does not exist. There are almost no documented, uh, almost no documented evidence of this whatsoever. Uh, and you can see study after study that show this. In fact, you think about it. If you commit voter fraud, it's a felony. Uh, it's a significant fine. You will lose your right to vote for your entire life. And what will you get out of it? Casting one vote in one election more than you were entitled to. It just doesn't happen. Uh, yet, almost every state in the nation this year and for the last several years has seen a law to require people to produce identification, government-issued identification at the polls in order to vote. And the one reason for that is to prevent voter fraud that doesn't exist. The reason this bill exists, the reason it's passing through the states, is it will have a disproportionate effect on minorities, elderly people, and low-income people. And that's because these are individuals that are either less likely to have an ID or less likely to carry one to the polls. Um, this is another issue that anybody that cares about voting and access to the polls should be very involved in, and they should be involved in blocking these laws from taking place. Um, along that line, and I'll finish with this, um, the other things we ought to do in Virginia that we don't do is early voting, which simply allows people to vote prior to Election Day. No excuse absentee voting. Virginia has a, a funky uh, absentee voting law that keeps listing all these different reasons you can give to vote absentee. Uh, but the truth is, you should just be able to vote absentee if you want to. It makes sense, and it makes uh, it a lot easier to implement because you don't have to ask people to swear what it is they're doing that's their excuse for not being at the polls on election day. Um, the last thing that should be considered in Virginia, and this is my pie in the sky for tonight, uh, is uh, same-day registration. Nine states have been experimenting with same-day registration. This allows you to go to the polls, register, and vote on the same day. And guess what? The nine states that have done this have seen no increase uh, in voter fraud, and on average, these states have a 12% higher turnout uh, on election day. All good reasons for making the polls more accessible. Thank you very much. Every year, how many bills we put forward to create felonies? And 
some of the things you would never think about. For example, if you steal a dog, that's a um, Well, if you steal a cat, it's not. Unless so do <laughs> So uh, there's a lot of myths out there about voter IDs. I'll stop on that. 
Constitution says the governor has the right to restore rights. It does not say he has to do it for each person individually one at a time. So what he could do is issue an executive order saying I am now restoring the right of everyone in Virginia who has lost the right to vote. Period. Done. No problem. Now the next governor that comes in, of course, it's an executive order. So the next governor that comes in can reverse the order. He can't, the next governor can't take back the right to vote from the people that have been given it, but then the number starts again at zero. Um, and um, we really, ho I mean, I don't know, but politically it's difficult, and we discovered that. We worked for several months deep inside the Kane administration with his highest senior officers dealing with this issue, and I'll tell you where they got bogged down, and whether it was a real place to get bogged down or not, is they, weren't, they said right off the bat, we're not going to do it for all felons, we're only going to consider nonviolent felons, and then we spent weeks going over what the difference between a nonviolent and violent felon was in Virginia, because that too is very complicated. It's complicated the way the law is written, it's complicated the way the records are kept with the law, and we got bogged down in this, and of course I kept saying, why don't you just restore everybody's rights, and then it'll be very simple, uh, knowing of course that wasn't going to happen. Uh, politically, it's difficult. It shouldn't have been. It shouldn't have been for a moderate Democratic governor. Um, possibly, this is the answer. Uh, Kane at the time was thinking about other things. He had already been appointed to be head of the DNC at the time. Uh, or maybe he was thinking about other parts of his political career. Did he want to leave with this as his legacy? We thought he might because it would have left something a strong statement for civil rights. Uh, that uh, Governor Kane has stood for most of his political career, uh, but we're unable to do it. Uh, we met with Governor McDonald right off the bat, 
uh, when he came into office and he said, no, that's not on the table, but let's talk about how we can streamline the process. And he has done that. And Governor McDonald is likely actually to restore more voting rights, uh, voting rights to more individuals than either Kane or Warner if he continues under the um, current uh, plan he's using. Um, but politically, it seems to be virtually impossible in Virginia for a governor to do that. It's going to take a very, very special person. Well, Mr. Hebert, you're, uh... Oh, shucks. Just as Julie comes up. And uh, here's my tech man to help me out. So uh, just to, while we're waiting here, I'm just going to mention one other thing. Uh, Mr. Young is correct that, you know, in Virginia, they do allow you to sign a declaration if you happen to show up, except, you know, in, I think it was Prince William County, maybe, where... Uh, a gentleman was on his way to the gym, uh, and when he was on his way to the gym, he had his sweatpants on and his sweatshirt, and he drove by his polling place, and he realized it was three minutes before the polls closed, and he hadn't voted, so he ran inside to vote, didn't have any ID, and they said to him, well, where's your ID? And he said, well, of course, I don't have it, but he said, can, can I file a declaration and then submit a ballot? And they said, no. So the ACLU went to court sued them and prevailed. So even though you have that right, Jack, sometimes local ele election officials are unaware of that option and think, and in fact require in some cases a photo ID, even though Virginia is not yet a voter ID state. But We do an election day uh, hotline, and it is the most common problem, people being told by poll workers that they can't vote because they don't have an ID, and then actually going home to get their ID, maybe even not being able to vote. Um, and that's a matter more than anything of, um, of educating the uh, poll workers. I assume that a strong leadership of the State Board of Elections, <laughs> <laughs> the board, the registrars, and their responsibilities under the village of Virginia, I just would assume that, that we have such a person, and Jerry, that problem will never occur again. I'll tell you, it's a minority, it's a minority of local election officials. We just get the wrong information. <laughs> and, uh, it's our job really to provide that uniformity, uh, the right of education. And we don't want to be in a position, uh, frankly, where, um, and I don't think most of us in this room are be in a position where you have to turn someone away not to vote. Different states have different ways of handling it, even though they some have photo IDs. Sometimes they allow you to sign a declaration that allows you to prepare your signature or to have a couple days to get your, your ID, bring it back, and make a position of how it's counted. But uh, usually all the safety valve, we like to call it. Yeah, here it's simply. It's simply an affirmation. That you are who you say you are. No, no, no signature, uh, that's no nothing. Correct. Well, I'm, I'm in a little bit of an unusual position. It's kind of like uh, if you ever go to court and you have your argument entirely prepared to say what you're going to say, but then you realize that the first questions uh, from the judge uh, have nothing to do with the argument you mentioned. And in fact, uh, seemingly the court is against you and so you have to overcome, uh, you know, an argument that you didn't anticipate in a sense. Um, and so uh, one of the uh, points I'm going to probably spend a few minutes on at the end of a presentation is the campaign finance, Citizens United, C4s. Uh, if you watch the Colbert Report, you know all the problems about super PACs. And my colleague at the Legal Center, Trevor Potter, is, is uh, Stephen's lawyer. So if you've seen us kind of giving him legal advice uh, on the show about campaign finance. That's our work, and we're really trying to educate people about the potential abuses here and how easy it is, if you really want to be mis mischievous about it, to block disclosure and to spend unlimited amounts of money to corrupt the political process, which is what we have today, uh, largely thanks to the Roberts Court. So I'm going to talk about redistricting first, though. This is what I came to talk about. There are four uh, essential legal requirements that come into play. One is the one person, one vote. We used to call it one man, one vote until we got politically correct. Um, Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, which protects racial and language minorities from vote dilution. In Virginia, you also have Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act. Virginia is a preclearance state, meaning that every voting change that Virginia or any of its political subdivisions make has to be approved in Washington, D.C. before it can go into effect. And it can, has to be approved by the Justice Department. Uh, controversial right now is whether or not this is the first time in the history since the Voting Rights Act was passed in 1965 that Democrats have been in charge of the White House when redistricting occurs. So the Obama Justice Department is now reviewing plans. 
What does that mean? It means that states that usually have Republican attorneys general go to the D.C. federal court rather than to the Justice Department for preclearance because they don't trust the Obama Justice Department not to play politics with redistricting, which is, if that isn't the uh, pot calling the kettle black, I don't know what was because the Bush Justice Department was without a doubt, without a doubt, the most political Justice Department in the history of our nation. And I worked there for 21 years, and I at least had, can speak to that 21 years. And that included years when uh, Ronald Reagan was president. I worked there, and George H.W. Bush. In fact, I was hired when Richard Nixon was president. And he wasn't even as political as the Bush people. Anyway, uh, before I get too all wound up on that, let me move on to racial gerrymandering. You're old enough to know Thomas Jefferson. I am. I, he, was a good, he was a law partner of mine. So, uh, so the racial gerrymandering doctrine, or the Shaw v. Reno doctrine, if you take professor's class, you'll, you'll understand that this is a doctrine that emerged only in the last 20 years. And it says that uh, shape matters when it comes to redi redistricting districts. That if, if a minority opportunity district, one for blacks, Latinos, Asian Americans, and, uh, Native Americans, if it's really bizarre in its shape, it looks like a bug splat, and it appears that race was the predominant reason for creating the district, the district is presumptively unconstitutional if you can show that. Doesn't mean it's illegal to take race into account. It just renders a district that's bizarre in shape or that race predominated its creation presumptively unconstitutional. The burden then would shift to the state or local government to prove that they have a compelling state interest in drawing the district, say compliance with the Voting Rights Act or federal law being one, and that their decision to draw the district was narrowly tailored. The last one is political gerrymandering. I took uh, two cases to the U.S. Supreme Court in the last decade, uh, Veef versus Jubilera out of Pennsylvania and uh, Lulac v. Perry out of Texas. We tried to get the Supreme Court to adopt a theory for when political gerrymandering uh, it violates the Constitution. We got four votes out of nine. That's not a good number. You need five. <laughs> but the court split, four, four, one. You had four justices, Clarence Thomas, Scalia, uh, uh, Rehnquist uh, and uh, whatever one of, I can, uh, Ken, not Kennedy, uh, anyway I'll think of it in a second, for saying that uh, it wasn't justiciable, you couldn't even bring these claims in court, then you had four justices, Souter, Stevens, Breyer and Ginsburg saying you could, and then you had Justice Kennedy who was the kind of the monkey in the middle, he said well I agree that it should still be justiciable but I can't agree on a theory with these other four who think it is justiciable, so I'm going to vote with the four who don't think it's justiciable to say this doesn't violate the Constitution. So with regard to political gerrymandering, the issue is justiciable. It just hasn't been justiced yet, you know, and we'll find out. Uh, we'll maybe see if that happens. So the one person, one vote population equality requirements, two distinct standards. You've got one standard for legislative and local districts. Uh, full disclosure, I represented the Virginia Democrats in the state Senate when we did redistricting this year. That basically gives you a 10% leeway in deviations to draw districts. I also represent the city of Richmond in their redistricting, which I believe is going to be concluded today. Um, and then congressional districts require more strict population equality. And there's a reason for that distinction we don't have time to get into today, but I'd be happy to talk with you about it if you want to know more about it. Uh, uh, this is interesting. This is usually uh, the bullets uh, that come your way when you're arguing a redistricting case. Uh, it requires states, uh, that one person, one vote, require the states to achieve population equality by making an honest and good faith effort. Note the standard uh, sounds the same as congressional, uh, but they are actually different. Um, the one state legislative and local, that comes out of the 14th Amendment. Cases like Reynolds versus Sims and cases like that, that say the 14th Amendment requires one person, one vote, a value of vote. Now why is this? Well, if I'm in a district with 500,000 people and Kent is in a district with 200,000 people and he has one senator and I have one senator, his vote's worth a lot more than mine mathematically. There's only 200,000 of them and they get one and I got 500,000 in mine and I get one. That's just not right. So the Supreme Court put this in play in the 1960s. Now, if you go above 10 percent in deviation, you just have to justify why you did so, showing that you followed really uh, state policies and you followed them consistently. Population equality for congressional districts comes under Article 1, Section 2. The leading case is Karcher v. Daggett. 
We call it the Karcher v. Daggett two-step in my book. Uh, this is uh, un unbelievable. I never even knew this was in there. But it's, uh, it's, it's one of those, the dogs out. Yeah, exactly. And this, is a, this is a dog that didn't get stolen. Uh, so it, it asks two questions when it comes to congressional redistricting. Could the population differences among the districts be reduced or eliminated through a good faith effort to draw equally populous districts? Well, the answer to that question is always going to be yes. If you draw congressional districts and you have a 20-person deviation overall, you know, one district has 19 people, too many compared to the ideal. You take the state population, divide it by the number of districts. One state has 19 people, too many. Another one has one person less than the ideal, so you have a 20-person deviation. I can come in and draw a map that has zero deviation, so I can make uh, a draw better districts than, than you can, which is why most people go down to zero deviation right now, or one person. We sued in Pennsylvania in 2001, the Pennsylvania congressional map. It had a 19-person deviation, and the federal court threw it out on the one-person, one-vote grounds. Now, why do the courts do that? Do they really think that census data that's two years old is really going to make a difference? No. What usually happens is the court feels there's something really bad. It doesn't pass the smell test with what happened. Maybe one side got shut out. Maybe no public hearings were held. Maybe the public didn't have access. The court is trying to get at a problem with the plan, and so it uses this strict population requirement to say, you know what, we're going to find this 19-person deviation to be unconstitutional, and that's the way I'm going to get at that. Democrats in Karcher v. Daggett had gerrymandered the districts terribly. The court there said, you know, we've got to really get at this problem. This was a terrible process, and they used a fairly minimal deviation in New Jersey to uh, strike the map down. So uh, that, the, my case in Pennsylvania, 2001, the court found that it was a lack of good faith and the deviation was therefore unjustified. The Voting Rights Act, I'm not going to get into much about that. It, hasn't, it, it still remains very controversial, the Voting Rights Act. There are about half a dozen cases right now pending in Washington, D.C., federal court, challenging the constitutionality of the Voting Rights Act. Um, Two years ago, a case went to the Supreme Court of the United States challenging the constitutionality of the act, and we thought there might be five votes in the Supreme Court to strike down the most successful civil rights law ever passed in the history of our country. But guess what? It didn't happen. This same Supreme Court ruled eight to one not to reach the constitutional question and instead to reinterpret the Voting Rights Act to allow people to escape from its coverage if they could show that they've been good over a 10-year period. So basically, if you've been on probation for 10 years and you can show you haven't committed any crimes or violated your probation, you can get out from under. It's known as bailout. And uh, the Supreme Court said, we're going to broaden and liberalize the bailout requirements and that'll keep the Voting Rights Act constitutional. I don't think there are five votes in the Supreme Court to strike down the Voting Rights Act because I don't think Justice Kennedy, who would have to provide that fifth vote, wants to go down in history as being the justice who cast the deciding vote to strike down the crown jewel of civil rights. The only footnote I'll drop on that prediction is this, that if there's a case up in the Supreme Court where it really matters to Republicans, then the Roberts Court will find the five votes to strike down the Voting Rights Act. Packing, that's a big issue right now. You take a district where a, a minority candidate is being elected at 55%, the state redraws the district and maybe bumps it up to 65% minority. Now, what if you have a neighboring district that's 45%? Well, if you pack one district at 65, it's going to preclude you from drawing a second district that will be perhaps majority minority and where minorities can elect their preferred candidate. So we see a lot of this happening now uh, where people will want to pack minority uh, votes, say in North Carolina it's happening right now, and the reason they pack is because that bleaches adjoining districts of black people. And so by bleaching those districts, it makes whatever white Democrats happen to be sitting there more vulnerable because in a lot of those jurisdictions we're talking about, people vote along racial lines. And so if you can get a district that, that takes out some reliably voting Democrats, meaning black voters, you can knock off a white incumbent or a white challenger. The Shaw v. Reno case, as I said, it's, it goes to the issue of excessive and unjustifiable use of race. It says that you know you, if you predominantly rely on race in drawing a district, 
and you do so and it becomes bizarrely shaped, or even if it's not bizarrely shaped, if the district is a perfect circle, but race drove the process of creating that district, you have to justify doing so. You could say we, could, we did it to comply with the Voting Rights Act, but you have to then get over a couple of hurdles. Well, if the Voting Rights Act on the one hand requires you to take race into account, and Shabby Reno says, well, yeah, but you can't take it into account too much, the state's kind of left in a little bit of a tug of war. So the last couple of decades, that has played itself out. It's not as big a problem as it used to be. Basically, if race is going to outweigh TRP, traditional redistricting principles, like keeping political subdivisions together, compactness, contiguity, protecting incumbents is a traditional redistricting principle. Maybe it shouldn't be, but in a lot of states it is. And here are some more. Maintain the partisan makeup of a district. Preserve the core of an existing district. Protect communities of interest. That we could spend a whole hour on, on that topic. And the Supreme Court has done a whole bunch of things to, to determine whether race predominated. They looked at the district shape and demographics. And you have all kind of animal names. If this looks like a serpent standing on his head at the zoo being beaten down by an elephant, one court said. It looks like you know the, somebody took a uh, horn and pulled it in one direction, and then a bug came along and split it in half, and it went ten different ways. You have all these spider-like, serpentine descriptions. So what it's become is you end up in a lot of these cases, if, if you draw bizarre districts, you're going to end up in what we call a beauty contest. You're going to have to prove your district is a lot prettier than somebody else's uh, in accomplishing the same thing. Statements made by legislators and staff, I always tell them LLSS, loose lips, sink ships. If you learn no other thing in law school, remember one thing, to tell your clients when you get out, don't write if you can speak, don't speak if you can nod, and don't ever nod if you can help it. And they'll never get in trouble. And that's usually good for lawyers too, by the way. And then if you, go down to, if you go down to the block level to do redistricting, census block level, the only thing available at the block level is racial data, usually. You can now, some people are, you can get a vendor to give you uh, political data. But for the most part, block data means you're going down to use race. And that's been cited by the Supreme Court as being problematic. So I'm going to uh, not talk about the partisan gerrymandering cases. I already said it hasn't been justiced yet. I will say that if you want to really, and when I represent clients, if I really want to have them successful, I'll document the process. I will record every meeting that's public. I will transcribe it. I will retain the notices we gave out to the public. And I'll include every piece of correspondence and, and try to get it. The, all of that can be important later because there's nothing to the race but the finish. And every road in redistricting leads to the courthouse. And you want to make sure that when you get there, that you're going to win. And the only way you can win is to prepare for litigation and then back up from the inevitable lawsuit to say, what can I do between now and then not to go over and hit some trip wire that's going to blow my client up down, somewhere down the road. Um, I'm going to just uh, go through this. Just public hearings, you should have public hearings. They're very important. We had them in the city of Richmond. They're really important to let people come out. For the state this time, they had a, a contest. I don't know if any of you applied, but you could actually draw maps online, and there was a contest. And uh, I think a team from William and Mary won, actually, right? Uh, and uh, and so you can have other ways to encourage citizen participation. The key to success is to adopt principles at the beginning, then stick to them. There's nothing worse than I, I represent a client. I'll keep the client nameless. A big city. And they adopt criteria, and they say, one of the criteria we're going to have is all the districts will be within 10%. So then they give me the map, and they go, hey, here's the map we're ready to vote on. The deviation is 16%. And I said, well, I thought you were going to stay within 10 And they said, well, you know, 10, 16. I said, no. There's a difference between 10 and 16. So build a record, prevail in court. Um, now let me just, I'm going to just say uh, one thing about, um, about uh, Citizen United. One minute. One minute. On Citizens United, the Supreme Court of the United States has now set, has unleashed corporate cash into our political system. As if corporations didn't have enough power before, now they have the ability to spend unlimited amounts of their treasury money. Now, if you ever look at Fortune 500 companies and you see how much treasury money we're talking about, 
And I, I love it when people come up to me and they say, well, yeah, but unions, they can now spend money too, just like corporations. If you look at the amount of resources that corporations have, the Fortune 500 companies, compared to unions, it's David and Goliath, cubed. Okay, it's not even close. So the ability and the potential for corporations to have deep pockets and corrupt the political system, it's, you know what we're going to have in this country? We're not going to have the senator from Virginia anymore. It's going to be the senator from CSX Railroad, because those are the people who are really going to start spending the money. And that's what it was before Teddy Roosevelt came in. And uh, the railroads really ran our country. Uh, and we came in and, in, the, in the heels of corruption. Corruption's great for reform, by the way, so I'm not against corruption. I like it, because once it happens, we can then do something. Look at Watergate as the best example. That's the best recipe for fixing a system is when it, it explodes. And this system is getting ready to explode. The C4s, this, these are groups that are supposed to be about promoting social welfare. And they're not even pretending anymore to be able to accept money that they don't have to disclose. And unlike a political action committee, which has a limit on how much you can give it, which you have to disclose where it's coming from, where it can't come from uh, certain sources, in the case of uh, C4s, they can take unlimited amounts of money, and we never know where it's coming from, and then they can take ads out that they call issue ads. Call Senator so-and-so and tell him to stop beating his wife. He says he only slapped her. Call him up and tell him what you think, just before 30 days before an election. And they call that, they say that's not a political ad, even though they target it in the person's district or something like that. So the sham issue ads, get ready for them. We're going to see them through the roof. And for the most part, we'll never know who, where they're coming from because it'll be Americans for better government, Americans for cleaner government, Americans for sound government. You name it, the good government name is going to be attached to every one of these ads, and we'll never know who's behind the money except one person, Karl Rove. We all know he's like that. <laughs> no, Karl is not the only person. Democrats have, Democrats have their, their uh, side of this, too. I'll close on that, and, uh, and we'll take questions. quite split on this uh, issue. As you can imagine, it is a First Amendment uh, issue, and the ACLU is, above all else, a, a First Amendment organization. Uh, the amicus brief, the ACLU filed an amicus brief uh, on the side of the First Amendment, uh, the, ultimately the prevailing side in this case. Um, yet there were still a lot of doubts. There's been a lot of discussion since, and the ACLU is beginning to 
shift position a little bit, and I think it mostly, for most people who want to sort of grasp this, is this notion about whether a corporation is a person or not. And I, that's a gross oversimplification of it. Uh, but the ACLU can come to a slightly different conclusion about this than it initially uh, came to if it, starts to if it starts to grasp the notion that corporations are not people. Um, and um, anyway, it's, it's, it is, I was going to let those two talk about it because they have, they have their own sides carved out. Uh, and it is a, an, a very complex and difficult question. We're certainly concerned, I would say the ACLU is concerned about the consequences of the decision, but from a First Amendment uh, principle stand, it, it took that, that, that free speech stand. And there is, um, there is a slippery slope question here, and you always have that with the First Amendment. Once you start to say, if they can't do it, then who else can't do it, then who else can't do it, and it's highly problematic. All First Amendment is issues are slippery slope issues. How's that going, Diane? Can I follow up on a slippery slope issue? Here's the real problem. I mean, I think it's nonsense, frankly, and I'm uh, you know, a fairly extreme uh, advocate for the Supreme Court of the United States to say corporations have the same First Amendment rights as uh, never said it before. Uh, in fact, the people who brought the Citizens United case didn't make that argument. Um, and the Supreme Court actually, after they heard oral argument in the case, set the case down for re-argument and said, maybe we should uh, have everybody brief the issue of whether we should overturn 100 years of case law and decide that corporations have the First Amendment right to use treasury money to make independent expenditures to influence elections. Now, and, and of course, they held 5 to 4 that they do. Now, here's the problem with the slippery slope, is once you do that, and you say that corporations have the same First Amendment rights as people, we have the right, Jack and I, as individuals, to make uh, contributions to candidates to a certain amount, right? So if there's a limit, for why if corporations have the same First Amendment rights, what about the corporate ban on making contributions? That seemingly is uh, at risk. Uh, there's a whole host of things now that suddenly are unleashed, and uh, as I said earlier, unleashing uh, an amount of money, the likes of which we've never seen. This will be a, uh, potentially, this will be a billion dollar election uh, coming up. And it may be even uh, one side may spend a billion. So, um, and I think it's a direct result of the Supreme Court. This has been the most corporate friendly Supreme Court that probably has existed in the years. But what do you say, Gary, to the, to the fact that Commonwealth Virginia uh, has allowed corporations uh, and others if they disclose, to contribute. You cannot, you cannot say that Jerry Belisles or Doug Wilder or uh, Mark Warner or Bob McDonald are tools of, the, of corporate America, can you? I could. Well, you could, but you'd be wrong. No, I, I, I think that, I, I think anybody who in the Commonwealth of Virginia thinks that corporations in Virginia don't have a lot of power down at the Capitol are set in the state. That's a different issue. Well, wait a minute. Not that election. No, 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 I'm talking about elections too. I'm talking about how much money both sides give to each major political party. They, there's huge amounts of dollars given. I mean, I represent political parties in Virginia, as you do. And we expect corporations, and we ask corporations to give unlimited amount, as much money as you, as you can, to our side, knowing that they're going to give it to the other side. But, I mean, they have lobbyists in Richmond for a reason. They expect their money to. Pay off. I mean, that's common sense. It's an investment. Well, it's a good segue to the delegate from well, and I uh, hope uh, we'll uh, give us our perspective on these issues as well as the others. We're just getting there. The, the, the lesson is that uh, we have to get our fees up and charge these corporations with legal advice more than we are now. <laughs> yeah. On that note, <laughs> the, the rule is get the retainer up front. No, no, no show. Well, let me let me just sort of put in. I, I'm actually here more for the practical. Uh, how does this actually work in the real world? You know, you've seen what the law is dealing with uh, redistricting. I got to actually see the sausage being made, and if legislation in general is sausage being made, you really don't want to see redistricting. But first, let me touch a little bit on the campaign finance uh, in Virginia, um, because I think the reason. And again, speaking only for myself, I think the reason that corporations have more influence in the General Assembly is not because of how much money they give to candidates. Because quite frankly, 
things happen so fast down there. When you are trying to make a decision on how to vote for a bill, you don't have time to stop and say, well, let me see how much State Farm gave me in the last election. You're thinking, okay, I've got a bunch of information thrown at me, and the corporations have the money to pay the lobbyists to be in the, in the lobby. That's why they're called lobbyists. And they literally are there making sure you have their side of the story, whereas individual citizens don't normally do that. Um, so I think that has a lot more to do with how votes are cast than who gives what. And I think one thing that elected officials can count is votes. And when you are facing a certain number of individual citizens who have called and expressed their opinion on an issue, and you've had one corporation, it doesn't matter who gave you more money. It matters at the end of the day which one is registered to vote and is going to show up on election day. And that's more what you're thinking about when you cast your vote. Because even if an individual gives you one dollar, an individual that gives you one dollar is much more likely to come and vote for you than a corporation or an, even an individual that gives you $10,000. Because most people or corporations who can afford to give you $10,000, it's a drop in the bucket to them. But most people who take the time to give you the 10 the 20 the $30 contributions, that's a big deal to them. They're invested, and they're coming out. And I think that's why you saw, you see, at least with the Obama campaign, so much of an emphasis on the individual smaller donors, because those dollars guarantee those people are coming out to vote. So that's my two cents. On, finally, I'll say, the only, and my husband started out as a political fundraiser. My personal opinion is all McCain Feingold did was create a whole new class of lawyers and consultants, and it doesn't really matter what you do. Lawyers and consultants will figure out a way to get however much money you need from however many people. But it has put pressure on individual candidates to spend a whole lot more of their time raising money than actually getting out and talking to voters. So that's my two cents, or 200,000 cents, or whatever, on campaign finance. So redistricting. You've heard uh, part of the law that we had to deal with, and I'm going to talk mainly just about the General Assembly uh, and our redistricting, and you think it's pretty simple. So you've got the Constitution that says, uh, the Constitution of Virginia says that our districts have to be contiguous and compact. The U.S. Constitution says one person, one vote. Then the House and the Senate uh, Privileges and Elections Committee adopted resolutions that outline criteria that they would follow when they draw the maps. Um, one was complying with the Voting Rights Act, population equality, contiguous, cont continuity, ugh, contiguity and compactness, single member districts, and keeping communities of interest together as much as possible. Sounds easy, right? Wrong. The most important decision that was made by the Privileges and Elections Committee was what percentage variation to use in drawing the maps. Um, and depending on what you read, you could go as high as 10%, 5%, you know, as low as zero. The Senate, 10 years ago, the House and the Senate did 2%. This year, the Senate did 2%. The House did 1%. Why does it matter? Because every little change you make when you're going census block by census block, can really make it difficult for you to keep communities of interest together and meet that 1% criteria. Um, and now that we have been pre-cleared by the Justice Department, I think I can give you a little bit more insight into what really happened without putting you at risk of being deposed in a court case. Um, but. So here's, so here's some of what you didn't see. Now, the governor had a bipartisan commission to come up with proposals. And they were all excited because they decided, well, let's come up with a new minority-majority district. How many people do you think saw that plan? Other than the summary, what's, not import what's important is not the summary or even the lines that are drawn. What's important is the report. And I invite you all to go. The General Assembly's website has a redistricting page. that has more than you ever want to know. But take a look at the final report that was run on the House and Senate districts. And what it does is it shows you for every district in Virginia what was the total population, what was the voting age population, 
what was the minority population, what was the minority voting age population. Now, I, I'm in the 71st House District. It was the most Democratic district before, at 71% Democratic performance index. It is now still the most Democratic district at 81%. But that wasn't the issue for the Republicans because they knew, or, or the people drawing the map, or actually it was one person, um, they knew they were never going to win my seat. So that wasn't the issue. Population-wise, my district grew. My minority population fell. That's a good thing, most people would think. In the city of Richmond, we have seen a huge... Uh, regentrification. We've seen an influx of people back into the cities. We've seen young people moving in, people coming from all over the country, you know, following their jobs down when Philip Morris moved. Uh, condominiums going downtown. VCU has exploded. But here's what happened. So my district went from roughly 55% voting age African American population 10 years ago to 42%. I'm surrounded by other Democrats. The second most Democratic district in the state is to the south of me. I'm also surrounded by minority-majority districts. They also had to have population changes, as did the districts that surrounded them. So what, when you had to draw that map, you had to say, OK, the magic number that was picked, I don't know why, was 55% African-American voting age population. If they could meet that bogey, they felt the Justice Department would think these districts do not retrogress. So that was the magic number. The original map that was drawn, when I got a phone call telling me, here's what your district will look like, drawn by someone who was only in the city of Richmond maybe three months out of the year, I was like, okay, now wait a minute. You have literally segregated the Churchill neighborhood so that I have the white streets and Dolores McQuinn has the black streets. Well, I didn't intend to do that. Now, wait a minute. You have literally split the fan neighborhood in a way that makes no sense. You have literally cut a hole in Oregon Hill where now you will have five people who need to have a voting precinct just for them. That was all because the map was drawn to meet two magic numbers, a 1% population deviation and a 55% voting age African American population. And so I and my surrounding delegates were told, if you can figure out a way to draw these lines so that you keep these communities of interest together and you hit those magic numbers, have at it. Sounds easy, right? Wrong. Three of us literally sat. Now, any of you could have done this. Anybody could have done it. Anybody could have gone to legislative services if you had a member with you. Because since it's a bill, legislative services will only make changes requested by a member of the General Assembly. But if you got a legislator to go with you, you could sit down at the computer and play with the lines yourself. And I literally went street by street, block by block, trying to keep certain neighborhoods together. Because for years, those neighborhoods thought of themselves as a community of interest. And it was literally, well, what happens if we go one block on Grove? Well, what's in the middle of Grove Avenue now? A dorm from VCU. No, you can't do that. Now your, your population deviation is 2%. All right, let's go this way. Let's go up into Church Hill. Let's move this block. Well, no, that street's too white. Now your African-American population has fallen. And so this had to be done for 100 districts to try to keep the 15 minority districts from retrogressing, to try to keep all 100. And just to give you a sense of how the population in Virginia changed, since, 2000, since 2001, Senate District Number 1 was down 14.9% in population. That was 20, so it needed to grow by 29,751 people. That's John Miller's district in the Newport News area. 
District 33, Loudoun County, Fairfax, was 58.2% overpopulated. That's 116,000 people. A Senate district is supposed to be about 200,000 people. So they had a lot of work to do. It was worse than the House. District 91, Delegate Helsel, he's new, so I haven't learned how to pronounce his name, in the York, Hampton, Pocosin area was down 19.9%. That's 15,936 people down. Bob Marshall, the 13th district, Loudoun, Prince William, 138% overpopulated. He had to lose 110,000 people. That is bigger than a house district, which was supposed to be 80,000 people. So you had that statistical battle going on. Then, imagine if you're the one having to draw the map, and you have people calling you at 2 o'clock in the morning from your own party saying the following. You have to put this street in my district because my son is in kindergarten at this school. Well, you don't represent that school now. Or you have to have, I have to have these three precincts because all my family lives there. But I also have to have these three precincts because I've represented them for the past 20 years. Well, you've got to lose. 10,000 people, so you got to give somebody up. Because if the most selfish time every 10 years is redistricting, it doesn't matter. You can't help it. Even I, with my 81% Democratic performing district, I knew there wasn't gonna anything going to happen to hurt me this year. Even I found myself saying, I'm really upset that I'm losing half of the fan district because these people vote. And oh, I'm also going to lose the elementary school where my son is going to go. You can't help but get caught up in it. And you never hear those speeches given on the House floor because the House floor speeches are what, he's exactly right, are set up to design what's going to be the court case. And for many of us who are sitting through it, it is worse than sitting through a deposition. But what was really happening, nobody ever saw except the 140 people who were there looking out for their own interests. Questions, uh, reactions to this experience? Any way to improve the situation? Anything in Florida that we might learn here in Virginia? Oh my God! Oh, man. <laughs> <All right. laughs> I think Jerry has some ideas on that, actually. Um, but actually, I don't want to steal what I want to say, but uh, I guess in, in a way, I'm very much like the delegate. Uh, we, the voters, are going to be the most confused. All this is the biggest change Virginia voters will go through the last next ten years. This, they're going to be in precincts. They're going to have new delegates and senators. And there's going to be confusion. And I thank God we have a series of elections that lead up to the big presidential election. But the fact of the matter is, is these are major changes, and, and most citizens don't know about Section 2, Section 5, redistricting, political gerrymandering. They really don't. In the end, all they know is when they get their voter card, it looks a lot different than it did 10 years ago. And they're going to be a little upset, a little confused. It's really, then it becomes our job becomes obviously the, uh, the delegates, the senator's job, to really educate the constituents. It becomes our job, because we don't want to have these voters. We don't want to have upset voters. We have to calm them down, make sure they're very, uh, mitigate the concern that this is where you're going to go. And believe me, uh, that, that was a great segue, because the, the phone calls, every time a new batch of voter cards hit a different area of the state, a phone call rises, and then it comes back down, and it rises, and so, it, I really think that's good. Let me just, a scare statistic on that, though, is only 59 out of 140 of the members of the General Assembly had gone through the district before. So, a lot of us, we think there's confusion among the voters. There's confusion among the elected officials. Quite frankly, it's up to individuals and organizations that, that champion voting rights to help filter through some 
one of the real problems that happened in the last cycle, uh, and happened to actually a member who is now in the General Assembly, well, he lost the race uh, because of confusion over redistricting. Uh, and one of the, one of the problems, uh, maybe an opportunity, but a problem uh, in Virginia is that the Constitution and 24.2 of the Code of Virginia require that you can vote where you are arrested. Even if you cast a provisional ballot, it will not be counted if it is cast in the wrong precinct. And that will happen a lot. So it's incumbent upon the political parties, candidates, and the state board of elections, along with the 134 of local elected boards, to make sure that voters do understand where they're supposed to be. Because it gets complicated. If I voted in John Adams for the last 25 years, and now I'm supposed to go to Ramsey School, that gets confusing, and it's more likely than not, if I'm not on the risk of voter list, Ramsey, they'll just let me cast a provisional ballot, and that is a no vote in Virginia. It's that simple. One, one of the things that can be done uh, is to build off the point Jack made earlier about um, what really resonates with people is that politicians shouldn't get to decide who's, who's going to be in the district. They shouldn't in a democracy. Politicians shouldn't get to pick which voters are in the district. In a democracy, the voters are supposed to pick their elected representatives. And that's why it's an insider's game. And that's why we find legislators trying to learn on the fly and things are happening. There's all kinds of other legislation to keep your eye on. And then somebody's tinkering with your district and hey, they don't even know my district or my voters or anything else. And so I think what we'll see, I, I do think there is a movement afoot. Um, some states have a, a, an ability to change things. Uh, through their constitution. You can have a referendum, for example, a statewide referendum. Some states don't have that referendum process. So you have to go through the, the legislature. We're trying to get politicians to give up the power to redistrict. I mean, that's like trying to, you know, have a mother give up the milk for her baby. I mean, you're just not going to take that away from them. So uh, it's just not going to happen. But we are seeing in a few states a move from California being the most recent. Just to put a, an exclamation point on it, when California adopted a 13 member citizens commission this year for the first time to do redistricting, they solicited applications. How many people applied? 32,000 people wanted to be on an app. So they could say, let me show the <laughs> If you don't think it matters how the districts are drawn, let me show All right, Ms. Young. Uh, thank you. Given the uh, time, I will be atypically brief, which will surprise you uh, and will also surprise me. Uh, so um, what I'd like to do is to go through the history of the Voting Rights Act, 1965-1967, um, first half, and then after dinner, I will continue with the rest of uh, uh, the presentation. Two points, very, very briefly. Uh, first, the Voting Rights Act. What we're really talking about is Section 5, uh, which was enacted to implement the 15th Amendment. You may recall that the 15th Amendment provides that, quote, the rights of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. It took us over 150 years to get to a point where we would say uh, that there are not invidious barriers to voting. And one of the ways that, that, is, that is effectuated is through Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act. It was a temporary measure uh, that has been reviewed and renewed in 1970, 75, 82, 2006, and in 2006 the renewal runs to 2031. It has been challenged as to its facial and as applied constitutionality. Uh, the leading case is a Northwest Austin utility, which was a little utility that was created in Texas uh, to regulate uh, basically power. Uh, it did not believe it should be uh, subject to the preclearance provisions of Section 5. The Supreme Court uh, sidestepped the question of constitutionality uh, and basically said that this little utility might be able to get out from under uh, Section 5 but that the issue of Sections 5's constitutionality would be for another day. 
Well, that another day has started to come. We have a series of at least eight cases that have been brought attacking the constitutionality of Section 5. I won't go through the cases. You can find them uh, on LexisNexis or West. But probably the leading case is Shelby County, Alabama versus Holder. Uh, it has gone before the United States District Court, uh, which found that Section 5 is still necessary to protect minority voters. That case will go to the United States Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit. It will be argued on January 19, uh, 2012. It may well be an issue that will be before the court in the next term. It is more likely than not that while there are these attacks, that Section 5 will be with us. The evidence is that we have not unfortunately erased all those vestiges of discrimination which lead to preclearance. And most of Virginia is subject to preclearance unless they do two things. One can show a history of non-discriminatory elections, and second, that they hire Jerry Hebert, who is now known as the bailout king. <laughs> and uh, you will owe me for that ad, uh, Jerry. <laughs> the, um, the second issue, as we talk about redistricting and gerrymandering, uh, is what is left. There are two big cases, Lulac versus Perry. And yes, that's the same Perry uh, who's the governor of Texas, who apparently was running for president uh, until the debates. <laughs> that with another case in Pennsylvania that Jerry has talked about, that leave us with the conclusion in the aggregate, there are some fine edges to it, but that redistricting is, particularly for this court, or at least a majority of this court, is a political issue. Uh, just like how we define the basis for redistricting, whether it's total population, citizen age population, that now looks like it is a political issue, and a political issue that the court will not address. Where that leaves us is Section 5 remains. Section 5 now turns on the enforcement efforts of the Department of Justice, or in those rare instances that a state wants to go to a three-judge court in the District of Columbia, which has shown a propensity uh, similar to uh, the current Justice Department. But as to redistricting, there is no question that in the end, redistricting is now a political issue with very little constitutional uh, controls after LULAC uh, and that, that puts a premium on political reform. Political reform particularly as to how the redistricting process works. Whether you hear from a sitting delegate as to the absolutely irrationality of the process or one looks at uh, the process itself, one can see only political self-interest. But those are the United States constitutional cases. There may well be ways to attack redistricting plans uh, under the Virginia Constitution. Uh, ten years ago, we went through that process without a great deal of success, but it is conceivable uh, that state constitutional remedies may still be available. I'll leave the rest of the time so that we can hear from the... Uh, fairly newly appointed Secretary of the State Board of Elections. So first, I'll invite comment on, on your predictions from the other members of the panel. Do you, do you think that um, gerrymandering is now a political question in the non, I, I assume you meant it in the non-justiciability sense? Well, I try not to use that word because I'm, I'm not sure now with this court what that actually means given the, the split of the court. I'm not sure what justiciability now means uh, whether it means just, whether it means ability, or whether it means something yet to be determined. But you, I, I, but you did mean that there's no judicially manageable or applicable constitutional standards to corral this this process of political gerrymandering. No manageable standards, yeah. 
problem you have with the political gerrymandering cases is that because the, the court hasn't agreed on the theory, what you end up doing is using the Voting Rights Act to really get at the political gerrymandering questions. And you have to, so most uh, Voting Rights Act cases today are really political cases that are masquerading as Voting Rights Act cases and usually being funded by one of the two major political parties to try to come up with some racial vote dilution theory. Uh, and oftentimes, you know, not that the claims are frivolous, they actually are very legitimate. You have people using all kinds of imaginative theories to come up with Voting Rights Act violations because the political gerrymandering bar is so high. Um, now, there are options in some states, maybe, and it's untapped to use the state constitutions to bring political gerrymandering questions and bring those in state court. It's uh, an untapped area yet. I thought we would see more of it this time around. We haven't in this decade yet. But uh, stay tuned, I guess. Jack, you did allude to Virginia and using the Constitution here for that purpose. Um, but then you cut yourself off. Do you have a theory on the Virginia Constitution? Uh, and so I'd like to hear it. It's uh, it's in love. It's, it's an equal protection claim is on the constitutional basis. We may be able to go back to traditional ideas of compactness, uh, contiguity, uh, some ideas of how we look at waterways. Uh, but let them. Uh, so my firm represents um, an interest in, in the general assembly. Uh, all I can say is um, events to be forthcoming. From Hebrew and Young in the future. Let's let the process go forward. I think it's not hard looking at the decisions that were made in the last one. You may recall that there was litigation um, actually standing just now. One thing I have figured out that standing matters. Uh, in that case, it's a very bright voyage, uh, misunderstood standing point. There is something left in what the Supreme Court um, said in the last cycle that would give you some. Okay. But, there, but there are certain basic at this juncture we have some ways to go in our own process um, before I want to preview what I think the General Assembly might have some difficulties. Standing is an interesting issue if I could just comment on standing because when you bring a lawsuit one of the things you have to do is make sure that the people that you are representing as the plaintiff they actually have an injury in fact that is particularized to what you're claiming. The Supreme Court has made it pretty clear in a case called Lujan uh, that you have to show that kind of injury. So just to use my prior example, in a one person, one vote case, your plaintiff should come from an overpopulated district because those are the ones being disadvantaged by the malapportionment. Um, when I was teaching at Georgetown, I, I got on my high horse one day and I said, you know, the problem with standing is the Supreme Court always finds that white people have standing and always finds that black people don't have standing, people of color don't have standing. And one of my smart aleck law students said, well, what about the environmentalists? They're always thrown out of court. And I said, well, they're not white, they're green. <laughs> I'll pass that on to you as a word to the Be careful of bringing cases because standing, you'll always be faced with that argument. Well, I sort of feel like the uh, the uh, voter that's just got in line and polls are about to close, but I just need it, so I'm going to vote. You have an ID? They, I don't have my ID, but I have a pen, so I can affirm myself. Uh, I'm actually I'm I'm glad that uh, we we got a full range. This is a lot of information that's been provided. I want to basically uh, talk a bit, little bit about at the polling place, um, since I guess I know a little bit about that. Voting rights and the access of it. I really try to, you know, when you take your experience having worked at the Civil Rights Division, for myself, I really tried to uh, sum it up as it really is trying to do what's best for the voter. And, and really, we try to take that um, in Virginia, the election officials who are called general registrars. That's something that I've asked them, and I asked my uh, folks in Florida to really pre it, the bottom line is is how is the treatment of the voter. Treat them as if the, they're uh, a, a, someone of value and to treat them as a client and the client's not always going to be right but you're going to treat them right and I think that just so you understand what we do 
There are, there are multiple elections involved with each election. There are the absentee process for Virginia, and many states are early voting. In Virginia, we have in-person absentee, which is almost a hybrid of early voting. Um, sometimes it can be uh, long lines, it can be very busy, it's a very cumbersome process, but it is a separate election in of it itself. And then you have election day. And so what you have is you have civil servants. You really have folks that may not even be college educated, on much less lawyers. But they are public servants, and they want to hold a fair and free election. They want everybody to be able to participate in the elections. They're very committed to that. But they have a lot of strains on them and, a lot of, and not a lot of money. And so I just want to point that out to you. Um, part of what we do is providing access to those that are disadvantaged. And it's really accommodating, I try to stress, it's accommodating the voter that may not be the 99 percentile. It's those that may be disabled. Take the extra step. Be prepared for what may occur for the disabled, the blind person that may, that may arise. The person may have difficulty understanding, perhaps, perhaps now in Virginia, that may not understand the language uh, fully, limited English proficient, or someone who may be, uh, who may be simply uh, un un you know, illiterate who may not be able to read. These are folks that occasionally do show up, and they need to be prepared for that. And it doesn't happen all the time. Sometimes you may not have someone who's disabled that comes in except that one person. And so that's a lot of training that goes into that person, and they need to be prepared for that. And so you get a sense of what the training the state board does with our local election officials. Our absentee voters, obviously this is another way we vote. And again, we need to take care of how we do this because it's actually sometimes most rates of uh, people being disenfranchised or making a mistake actually has to do with absentee voting. It has to do with folks that perhaps um, uh, without the, the, let me back up just a minute, the Help America Vote Act, Vote Act provided some ability for an in-house um, voting machine to actually help the voter who may make a mistake, undervote, overvote. So we have a lot of technology that has helped us increase it, but absentee ballots, often people will make mistakes that may not be correctable at the polling place. So these are things we try to accommodate. We also have the overseas and military uh, absentee voters who have a large rate of disen disenfranchisement because they are so far, they're remote, where the mail system just doesn't allow a short period of time in the mail. It normally takes all of those 45 days that the new MOVE Act required. And so the point I'm trying to make is that, as we, we talked about with redistricting, uh, the election officials are left with a statute, with a law. We have to sort of find a way to make it work for everybody. And sometimes that's a very difficult process. You could do it by rule or regulation. Sometimes it's procedures. But we have to be true to the, to the election code, which obviously our legislatures adopt. And we have to find a, make, a, find a way to make it work. I'm a big believer in technology. I believe that we're moving into an age of, of uh, uh, Computers, obviously, and online, everybody's online. There has to be a way that we can increase access, but also you know, bear witness to the integrity part of the statute. And for example, online registration, I think there's ways that that can happen. And so this is the, this is the situation where the state board uh, and the civil servants out in the field that are running the elections, the, they're trying to, to basically uh, effectuate the laws that the, uh, the assembly passes. Redistricting, again, it's going to be uh, it's, it's, it's a huge change. There was a very technical uh, process that had to be updated on the statewide database. A lot of voters are going to see change, but it took a lot of civil servants to make that work, and, it's going to, and they're going to make it work for the next couple of elections. We have the PPP, we have the primary, and then we have the presidential election. And, and, and so that's really the point I wanted to make, is that there's really three elections that take place, uh, absentee, in-person absentee, and in person, and it's really their job to make it work for you. Thank you. So how far are we on this question of a paper trail? And uh, where we have voting machines and, and some people don't trust them entirely for recounts and that kind of thing, where are we in, in guaranteeing that there's a backup system to verify the voters? Well, Virginia's moving up. Uh, slowly toward optical scan. In Florida, I, I went through that process. In Florida, we transitioned from DOE to optical scan. Um, but again, I, I would point out, and I'll just, and, and so we're slowly moving in that direction. There wasn't an outright ban on DOEs. We continue for accessibility and the fact that they 
they're going to allow the uh, localities to use them for their lifespan until they, they can no longer uh, operate. Um, that's not the greatest position to be as an election administrator, believe me. Uh, optical scan also has its own challenges. Um, a lot of paper means there's a lot of potential for problems. Accounting problems, recount issues. The, the DREs are, are a lot of them. citizens actually like them a lot, but it brings a whole host of issues that the assembly has decided we need to move away to that. So, um, and the technology is a little bit slower with the, with the optical scan. There are been some improvements in the optical scan, but uh, we're still dealing with some, most, most optical scan technology is still 1960s based. Uh, so it's like back to the future. Um, but um, like the governor once said, and the governor of Florida asked, you know, asked us whether or not we were all the array of time, could we, could we run an election on optical scan? We sort of, I looked at the Secretary of State, we looked at each other, yeah. Uh, and, and so it's true, we, we can do it with optical scanning, so that's what the uh, law says and what we should do. There's two, there's actually two advantages in that optical scan. One uh, is that um, the recount section has been changed again to allow in a recount to run the optical scan back through the counter. And that also allows uh, observation uh, of the ballots, whether they are overdose, underdose. Uh, first. The second uh, is that they are at least recountable. Um, and I think that is at least some guarantee uh, in Virginia that if there's a recount, as there was with Beth Wilder, uh, as there was with the PDs, and where there have been recounts across the Commonwealth, where we have optical scans, we are more likely than not uh, comfortable that the results both of a hand count or a rerun uh, are what they should be. Now recall in the three days, uh, Bob McDonald, uh, this is why the three counts do matter, because whoever would have won that race anymore than Bob and the governor one of them did. Uh, we did have a, an ability to run the optical scan uh, back through um, uh, the counters, and that left us with simply the paper result, both for optical scans and for DRAs. There are no, in my view, really good ways to put paper trail on existing equipment. Because that raises a whole host of questions. We have moved toward optical scan. Interesting, the world, whether it be the Philippines, um, others are going to optical scan because at least the best, the best evidence of the vote is still there. And if you may recall, in 2000, the probably the four counties, the only one that was successful recount was in Volusia County, um, where it was optical scan, and that county actually reported its results within the first deadline set by uh, the Secretary of State, whose name uh, remains uh, lost to time. Because I don't want to pick up count. <laughs> there's, there's another advantage, to, just quickly, to, to optical scan, and that is voters like it. Voters like, they like having a piece of paper. They like knowing the paper is there uh, and that it can be recounted. They don't, still don't trust machines that are entirely digital. Um, and um, so, uh, I mean, I think that's an important part of this, that, that at this point. So it may be that this is, you're right, we're sort of going backwards a little bit in terms of technology. But it's one, as long as the recounts uh, is possible, uh, that maybe we'll have both the confidence of voters and will be absolutely accurate. Good point. On the uh, confidence of voters, it seems to me that one of the reforms worth pushing is uh, to have elections run in a nonpartisan way. Um, in a lot of places, uh, you know, Jack just cited Catherine Harris, Secretary of State in Florida, there was no doubt in anybody's mind that as a chief election officer in the state of Florida that she was acting in a partisan manner. And there's a movement afoot in this country actually to uh, try to bring about situations where state and local election officials are not, uh, you know, suspect politically. That they, you know, they're just there, they're, they're civil servant type uh, people who are career interested. Um, one of the things in Virginia, every electoral board, every city and town has an electoral board. It's made up of three people. And, and two of the three people get to be of the same political party as whoever won the governor's and it switches. So when McDonald came in, he had two Democrats and one Republican, and switched to two Republicans. That just seems crazy to me, frankly. 
I don't really think that all the electoral boards I've represented, I see them acting in a, in a pretty even-handed, bipartisan way. But, you know, I just think that elections ought to be not, you know, so tainted with partisanship, uh, and particularly at the state level. So, Mr. Palmer, I'd, I'd really like to see, do you, what do you think about uh, requiring that, particularly at the state level where the administration of elections is really important, and the state board of elections has a lot of responsibility. What do you think about that? Well, I think that uh, when you look across the, uh, the country, almost every state has its own story about how they got to where they got. I mean, right now, Florida has an appointed secretary of state. And, uh, you know, at the time, you know, Captain Harris, uh, I was a Floridian, but I was overseas. She was elected. And we saw what happened there. Um, but I don't necessarily think an elected official would necessarily be, you know, automatically suspect because they're accountable to the people. But on the other hand, you could say that someone appointed by the governor is accountable to the governor responsibly. He could hire or fire her. Um, it's, it's difficult to, uh, it's, you know, and then there's other ways. Sometimes it's the legislature who appoints an election official. So um, I like to say that um, every state has its own story about how they got probably through some crisis and problem, and they, they tried a different route. And Florida right now, for example, is trying the appointed route. Um, I, I agree that in most instances, particularly on the local level, um, that when you first come, you're pretty surprised you have this partisan makeup. There is some overlap that you have because it takes time for people to come off the board. So for the first year or two, you're going to have, um, but you're right, you're very committed uh, civil servants. People try to leave their, their uh, political uh, baggage at the door. Um, I actually think that even though it may not be the best, you know, care for common, you know, the best uh, system, I think that, you know, sometimes you find worse. And I think it's in New York and Ohio, where literally, literally, if there's five Democrats working in an office, there have to be five Republicans. And, it's, and almost nothing can get done, frankly. Because I like to say that 99.9% .9 of election administration is, is really nonpartisan. It's, it's making the trains run, just to make them run on time. And that 1.01% 1, that 1 .01 is just infantile as to how much power some of low level bureaucrat you have. But, but. And I guess as a practical matter, and I think the same is true for your district man, as a practical matter, I don't know how you take politics out. Because whether you have the General Assembly drawing the districts or a or a commission, the commission is appointed by somebody, that's a political process. If it's a court, the judges are appointed by somebody. Ultimately politics plays into that. Whether you have an elected uh, cam uh, campaign official or an appointed, there's politics involved in that. I really don't know as a practical matter what system can completely divorce politics from the process. I think the only, the, the, and maybe this is being tonight, but I'm willing to be tonight. I think accountability is key, and the way we have accountability is to try to increase and if you have citizens showing up at the committee meetings, and you have citizens asking the questions, and asking the tough questions of the officials, there will be that accountability. And we have a long way to go there. And again, I think that's where people like you come in, um, where organizations like the JCLU and the Richmond for State Voters, and even the political parties. That is the only way we will ensure our fairness, which is the thing the best we can hope for rather than trying to take politics out. Because politics is all about people. And as long as people are involved, you're going to have politics. Well, I think you can do one thing, and that is that I think you can, in all these instances, uh, insulate uh, those that are entrusted with the administration of uh, the election laws from certain political influences. I, mean, I think it should be inappropriate for anyone the governor's office ever talk to anyone in the state or for a lot of other instances. Delaware has actually uh, been successful in removing uh, their election administration process just about the top. Now, Delaware is a small state. It's a small wonder. Uh, but it is nonetheless, I think, beginning of an example. Um, we've, had, we've had problems in the past in Virginia. We also had a tradition uh, of a fairly independent agency uh, that I think has been somewhat lost. Hopefully, um, uh, this board will uh, appreciate the 
sensitivities um, and believe that nonpartisan administration and non contact with the players it is the best way to stay above uh, the fray and, in fact, uh, even avoid the appearance. This magical thing that all lawyers have to be spirit about it, the appearance of impropriety. Uh, so I am hopeful that that is actually where Virginia is going. Virginia can be a model uh, for democracy. This is a fatal democracy that need not be grateful for democracy. <laughs> Would you like to make a couple of questions? Um, actually, if uh, you could ask the mind, ask the question of kind of reception uh, that's lost you with us. Um, I do want to thank everybody for coming out. I, th I did want to acknowledge uh, our moderator, uh, Professor Fagan, who's done a great job, as well, about, as well as our great panelists. I also wanted to acknowledge the sponsors of this event, uh, the American Constitution Society for Law and Policy, the Black Law Student Association. Uh, Bar Reef was a sponsor as well, and the Metro Richmond Area Young Democrats. But if we could give our uh,